Hey friends, welcome to ComScience. In this video, we'll try to cover the basics of Git. After watching this video, you should be able to work with any remote repository and push your changes to that repository. Let's get started. Let us understand Git by taking the hypothetical example of Tom. Tom is a newbie to Git. He has not had any experience with it from before. But his team's code base is managed using Git and he now needs to collaborate with his peers. Let us see how Tom would go about accomplishing that, shall we? The first step is to get a local copy of the remote code base on Tom's computer. Tom selects a location in his local computer to clone the remote repository. He goes to that location and runs the command git clone followed by the URL of the remote repository. Doing so results in all the code contents in the remote repo getting cloned or copied file to file, line to line in Tom's local computer. Tom now has his own version of code to play around with. Great. Now that we are done with getting a local copy of the code, imagine this scenario. Tom would be working on a high priority bug today and making code changes. But tomorrow, if he gets the instruction to switch and work on another super duper high priority bug, what does Tom do? Does Tom go back, copy the URL of his remote repo and clone it somewhere else in his local computer and start working on it? Nah, Git is for smart people. Here is a way to accomplish just the thing that Tom wants to do. Before starting to work, right after cloning the repository, he checks which branch he is working in. The command for that is git branch. He gets to know that the branch is master, marked with a star which contains the exact copy of the remote repo he had cloned. To create a new branch, Tom runs the command git branch followed by the name of the branch to be created. In this case, it is bugfix1. After Tom has run the command, he is able to now see two branches. Both of them seem to have the same code of the remote repo, but the size of his local folder has not doubled. This is git magic. On looking closely, Tom finds out that there's a .git folder created in the local location where he cloned the repository. This is the magic folder. What's happening here is that git is storing only the changes or the diff from the original branch while storing information about a new branch. That way, git can save a lot of space. Let's see how. Let us take the example of a repository that is being managed using git. There are two additional branches created apart from the original master branch. Notice the bugfix1 branch. The file in green is the file that got added to the branch. Notice the feature2 branch. The file in green got added and the file in red got modified. Git does this magic wherein it is able to keep a track of the current state of the branch by just maintaining the information about the diff, that is the difference from the original branch, and thus construct the resultant branches on the go. When the total number of files is in the order of thousands and the number of files that actually got changed are a handful, this results in a tremendous memory improvement. This is how Git makes us believe that we virtually have access to three code bases whereas in reality we have just the one. We can use the git checkout followed by the branch name command to switch to the branch that we want and Git makes sure that we see the folder and the files exactly as per the changes we had made in that branch. Next is the git add command. When Tom has made the code changes required, he needs to use this command to add files to the staging area. Hmm, what is the staging area? When we make code changes, it makes sense to keep track of those changes as a chunk of logically related files rather than in an unrelated manner. The staging area helps us accomplish this task. We can add files to the staging area by using the command git add followed by the file path. Whatever file we add to the staging area in this manner will all be the part of next commit that is going to be made on that branch. We'll soon get into commits, but before that, let's look at the git status command. The git status command, as the name suggests, gives us an idea about the current status of the branch. Basically, it tells us how the current branch differs from the original branch. It also presents us with information regarding what changes are unstaged and what changes are staged, that is, what changes will be a part of the next commit. Like in this example, we would like to push the changes made to index.css and index.scss, so we have added them to the staging area by running the git add command, whereas we did not want to push the log file and hence we have not staged that file. Tom has now made changes to the files he wanted to. 
he now wants to make commit to his branch feature 2. To state again, commits are checkpoints in the code history of your repository wherein code changes that were related to each other in some or the other way are grouped together. Here, we can see that there were initially three commits to Tom's repository and hence his branch feature 2 inherited those three commits when it got created. Now, Tom commits his changes to the feature 2 branch by running the git commit command and thus a new commit is added on top. From now on, all the changes that he made are persisted on the feature branch and are grouped under the commit 4. Tom has the code changes committed to the feature 2 branch, but that is just a local commit, a local checkpoint limited to that branch. Remember the master branch that we had before creating the feature branch? It still does not have the commits created by Tom. But we need to get those code changes in the local master branch in order to push those to the remote master branch. In such scenarios, git merge is our savior command. We check out the master branch by running the git checkout master command, then run the command git merge feature 2. This gets Tom all the commits that are present on the feature 2 branch into the master. Now Tom just needs to sync the changes to the master branch of the remote repository and he's done. Tom has now synced the local master branch with his changes from feature 2 branch. But still, his changes are limited to his local system. Anyone else developing on the same repository cannot yet access Tom's changes. For that, he needs to push his changes to the remote repo from where he got his code in the first place. Notice how the remote repository has three commits that we started with. To send our commits there, we need to run the command git push origin master because we are pushing changes from the master branch to its origin, the remote repo. After this command is run, we have our remote repository up to date with Tom's changes and anyone can access them. So after running all these commands, what we are left with is this, a remote repository that now has 4 commits including the commit that Tom made. To sum it up, we cloned a remote repo, create a development branch, made changes to it, created a commit, merged the commit to master and then pushed the commit to the remote repo. We just skimmed the surface as far as the functionality of Git is concerned. There are hundreds of workflows that you might want to accomplish and run into several unique situations where knowing the proper Git command might just save your life. We will be uploading more in-depth videos about specific Git workflows soon. Please subscribe to the channel to get notified when we do so. Also, let us know in the comment section how you felt about this video and suggest us topic for our future videos. Thanks a lot, see you next time.